Tonight, uh, Nikki Case is joining us, uh, just trained in from Boston. And for those of you that don't know Nikki Case uh, and their work, Nikki does amazing, uh, uh, amazing projects that you often call uh, explorable explanations, right? You tell you 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 tell stories with about numbers and math, and they are projects that are hard to categorize, and that always usually means that there's something really interesting going on. They're not quite games in a traditional sense. They're sort of essays. They're also interactive. They're kind of educational, but they're not what we normally would think about education. And they explore a whole range of topics that include everything from. Uh, things about uh, uh, politics and, and voting uh, systems to uh, game theoretical uh, systems and uh, things like how people sort themselves into different neighborhoods and even coming out to one's, one's family and parents uh, as well. So there's, there's a whole kind of range of interesting topics that range from mathematics to, to, to social issues and politics. And through it all, I think n you can sense if you uh, look at, at Nikki's work, and I think I'm sure we're going to see it tonight, a kind of, there's a sort of restless creative intellect there that is, um, that is exploring issues and topics, but not just uh, not just as a, as a kind of self-contained activity, but really sharing them with a public and with an audience. And in fact, one of the interesting things about Nikki's work is that, is that they are so participatory, and that as you're reading about a topic, you, are, you, you must engage with that topic in a very direct way. And that even extends to things like uh, whole tools that you've designed for, uh, for, for thinking about and understanding systems. I think that so many of us talk about things like systems thinking and design thinking. We talk about what does it mean to live in the 20th century and kind of combine areas from, uh, combine areas from, um, things like uh, 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 procedural representation to, to mathematics and, and emergent complexity to, and, uh, and applying them to, to, to real, real world issues. And a lot of us kind of talk the talk, but Nikki Case is really walking the walk. And so um, it's really a pleasure and it's really a delight to bring someone here who's doing uh, groundbreaking work, but with such a such a such a light touch and such a sense of play and and curiosity that uh, one can't help but find infectious. So it's with with really really deep pleasure and admiration as a, as a fan and also as someone who studies your work to welcome you here tonight. Please join me in welcoming Nikki Case. Oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for spending, you know, half an hour of your mortal lives to come see me blabber for about an hour. Uh, so, yeah, let's get started. Part one, the problem. So, learning. I love learning, you love learning. All of us were born with that powerful, innate desire to learn. And when you grow up, you get to keep like 10% of that desire, so that's great. Uh, so if you're here at NYU Game Center, you also probably are interested in two other things. Games and education. In games, players absolutely love learning. They love trying, failing, and growing a deep, rich understanding, while in formal education, they try. Um, so the point is, there is a connection between games and education, and that is... <laughs> Welcome to the NYU Game Center, <laughs> Uh, there, there we go. Yeah. yeah. And can you can you all hear me from this? Yeah. 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 All right. Great. Uh, there's a connection between games and education, and that is learning. Uh, and in my work, I also try to connect games and education. Uh, and I don't mean math blasters. Uh, I don't slap achievements on a multiple choice quiz. None of that sugar-coated Skinner box for me. Um, so what I do instead is I make simulations uh, of real-world systems or explorable explanations. Uh, for example, I made simulations to explain bias and discrimination, um, social networks and behavior, alternative voting systems, and fireflies for some reason, and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, I also occasionally make interactive stories, uh, like one about my experience coming out as queer to my parents, and my next game, y'all get a sneak peek, 
uh, will release at the end of April, and it'll be a story about anxiety disorder. Neither of these are relevant to my talk today, so let's just forget about them. Uh, so learning, specifically learning by doing. Uh, all my life, I've known that the best way to learn is by doing, and, and I mean, that's how we learn how to ride bikes, or design games, or give talks. Uh, so a few months ago, I finally decided to dive into the empirical scientific uh, literature on learning and discovered that I was completely wrong. Learning by doing actually has zero or negative impact on learning for novices. I had totally drunk the constructivism Kool-Aid, and my whole career was found on a lie. So that's the end of my talk. Uh, I'd give you a refund, but it was free. So, bye! <laughs> So, there's more. <laughs> so yeah, this talk is yeah, partly a confessional to repent for my sins against science, uh, but also for me to try to share what actually are the more scientifically backed ways of helping folks learn. And some of those do include learning by doing. Whew. Um, so let me explain exactly what those uh, studies uh, uh, have found about learning by doing. So if you imagine a scale from novice to advanced learner, and yes, that is what an advanced learner's brain looks like. <laughs> Your temporal lobes turn into bulging biceps, 100% accurate. Uh, so the empirical evidence from the experiments they've done in labs so far is that for novice learners, uh, passive ways of learning, uh, like being shown a step-by-step -step solution of, to a problem, is better uh, than active ways of learning, like trying to solve the problem for yourself, for novices. So if you try to ask a novice to solve a problem for themselves, uh, it has, again, as mentioned, zero or negative impact, average impact, on their learning in these experiments. Usually they, result, they resort to trial and error, or they just give up. And this finding has been replicated, because you know psychology, you got to make sure it replicates these days. Um, so it's been replicated across several studies on different subjects from physics to programming, uh, and on tasks from skill acquisition to knowledge transfer. And uh, that would be disappointing, but here's where it starts getting weird. Although for novice learners, passive learning is better than active learning, for advanced learners, active learning is better than passive learning. What? And if anything, I would have thought it would be the other way around, right? Like the beginners would find the learning by doing to be more accessible and engaging, uh, while the advanced students are more willing to put up with a wall of text and a lecture. Um, this paradox is called the expertise reversal effect. But why does this happen? And if it's true, why does it, well, why does it intuitively feel to a lot of people and to me that learning by doing is just obviously better? So to understand the expertise of reversal paradox and its impact on games and education, we have to look at a third link, cognitive psychology. It's a subfield of psychology full of lab tests and fMRIs, uh, trying to understand how we understand, uh, how we think, reflect, solve problems. So without further ado, uh, let's learn about how we learn. Explanation. And a note for me to drink some water. Um, so disclaimer, and the same disclaimer goes for any like pop sci thing. Um, mentally prefix everything I'm about to say with this sentence. This is a huge oversimplification, but <laughs> just put the simplification but in front of everything I say and we'll be good. So here's a head, here's a brain, and the first big lesson from cognitive psychology is that our long-term memory is awesome. It's why you never forget how to write a, how to forget you never forget how to ride a bike. Uh, why you know over 10,000 words in native language, even if you don't quite master the grammar. Um, and why you, can why you can perform complex skills like play games or design games. And uh, now your long-term memory isn't in any single place. It's spread out across your cortex as a network of connections. Uh, neurons connect to neurons, ideas connect to ideas. Uh, and that's how long-term memory is so amazing, which brings us to our second big lesson from cognitive psychology, our short-term memory sucks ass. <laughs> you know that moment where you want something from a different room, so you go to that room, and when you get there, you forget what you wanted? Short-term memory, <laughs> that's, that's that. Uh, oh, and as a quick side note, uh, in the scientific, the scientific research, research now, um, 
they call short-term memory working memory these days, uh, just to emphasize that uh, it's more than just a storage. It, it, you actually work with these things in your uh, short-term memory. But you know, they're synonymous, so I'll just say short-term working memory uh, for the rest of this talk. It's kind of a mouthful, but there we go. Uh, so if long-term memory is kind of like a giant bottle, our short-term working memory is like a tiny, tiny bottleneck. And that's why in both games and in education, it's generally considered bad practice to just dump a whole bunch of information or just give them a wall of text. Because our short-term mem work short working memory has a strict limit. And what is that limit? Well, it's four plus or minus one chunks. That is actually the technical term in the literature, chunks. We used to think it was actually seven plus or minus two. Uh, but then the scientists realized we suck even more than that. So <laughs> four plus or minus one. Uh, but then here's the question. If our working memory is this small, how do we do anything? Like how do we design or code or make music or art or write? So to understand this, uh, let's first demonstrate this limit. So try to memorize the following list. XCN, NFO, XMSN, BCX. Uh, you can obviously tell this will be really hard because there is no connection between any of these letters. Therefore, this forces you to try to remember 13 unconnected chunks. And this is way above our short-term uh, working memory limit of 4 plus or minus 1 chunks. But now try memorizing this list instead. X, CNN, Fox, MSNBC, X. If you're American, this list should be a lot easier. Oh, did you get the joke? Did you get the? Did, did you figure it out already? <laughs> this should be a lot easier to remember because now you only need to store three chunks. Uh, X, cable news, X. And then here's the trick. Your brain connects the cable news chunk uh, in your short-term working memory to the three names in your long-term memory. If, and so that's why the second list is so much easier to remember than the first, even though, and you already saw this, they're the exact same letters <laughs> in the exact same order. <laughs> <laughs> and that explains how we can do complex tasks like create art or code or design games, even with this small limit. Because even though we can only hold four plus or minus one chunks in short-term working memory, uh, they can connect to far larger networks in long-term memory. And the more you learn, uh, the larger chunks you can have. And that is also the ex explanation for our uh, expertise reversal paradox. So imagine, again, we have the novice and advanced learner. Uh, and then we both give them an active problem-solving task. The advanced learner has the necessary connections in their long-term memory, so the task makes perfect sense to them. Uh, but the novice doesn't have those connections, uh, so they just see a total mess. Uh, so without the help of long-term memory, this task overwhelms our novice's uh, working memory. Therefore, they have to resort to trial and error, or they just give up entirely, or cheat. You could do that too. Um, either way, they cannot effectively <coughs> learn. Uh, meanwhile, our advanced learner does have help from their long-term memory, uh, so the task does not overwhelm their working memory, uh, but it still gives them a good challenge. Uh, so therefore, they get the learning benefits. So that's the expertise reversal effect, and this is all predicted by one of the most evidence-backed uh, frameworks in educational psychology, uh, cognitive load theory. So this theory states that we have a very limited short-term working memory. Uh, therefore, we should design learning material in both games and education uh, to fit this human limitation, uh, to cut along the grain of human nature, as it were. Um, and this idea of load also provides a convenient metaphor uh, to intuitively understand uh, the expertise reversal paradox. Because saying passive is better than active for beginning learners, but active is better than passive for advanced learners. If that's confusing, well, it's just like saying, huh, five pounds is better than 200 pounds for a beginning weightlifter, but 200 pounds is better than five pounds for an advanced weightlifter. Why is that? Why is there a weightlifting reversal paradox? Oh my gosh. And when you put it this way, it's like, yeah, duh, yeah. Um, so yeah, you can handle, so therefore you can handle heavier physical load because you've built more muscle, and likewise you can handle a heavier cognitive load because you've built bigger networks in your long-term memory. 
So that's the explanation for the ex expertise reversal paradox. But there's still an unresolved question. Why then does it feel like learning by doing is just obviously better? I mean, like, I feel like I learned how to design games by actually designing games. Uh, and when you play a game, aren't you learning its mechanics entirely by doing? Um, so why does it feel like actively learning by doing is better than passively learning by observation? That is because learning by doing is better after you've done the learning by observation. Because remember, while passive is better for novice learners uh, and active is better for advanced learners, novices do eventually become advanced. Uh, therefore, and this is what uh, other experiments in the worked examples literature has found, uh, is that a great way to create learning is to give a student a passive task and then immediately follow that up with an active task. So for when, like for example, they would give them, um, they would show like how another student would step-by-step uh, step solve a problem and then like let them actually solve that problem. Uh, well, at least a different problem that's similar to that. So it's learning by observation and then learning by doing, or monkey see and then monkey do. Uh, so for example, I thought that I learned uh, game design by just doing game design. I was wrong. Before anyone learns to design games, they first play games. Uh, lots of them, and so did I. Uh, authors first read a lot. Musicians first listen a lot. Filmmakers first watch a lot. So before learning by doing, we all first learn by observation. Monkey see, then monkey do. Uh, but what about learning inside of games? Isn't that all entirely learning by doing? Uh, well, we'll see later that even for games that are famous for actively learning by doing, uh, they actually first start off with a bunch of passive uh, learning by observation. And you realize I've been doing like these scare quotes like this whole time. So my recommendation is just take these words, go for a three-pointer, and just kind of <laughs> dunk them in the trash. Because uh, they're super misleading, they're not helpful. Because, for example, someone reading a dense book might look passive even though their mind is super active, and someone who's just trial and error button mashing, uh, they may look active, but their mind is completely passive. So instead of thinking about whether or not this task is passive or active, uh, I think think about pairing the right cognitive load uh, with the right brain. Uh, so if you have fewer connections in your long-term memory, uh, you could get, you should get lighter challenges. Yeah, you should, if you have fewer connections in long-term memory, you should get uh, lighter challenges for lighter cognitive load. Uh, while if you have more connections in long-term memory, uh, you should get uh, heavier, heftier challenges because uh, you can handle that cognitive load. So yeah, now you know all the basics of the science of how we learn except for how we actually learn because I have not explained how does one actually go from being a novice to being an advanced learner? How does one actually build all those connections in long-term memory despite the limits of our short-term working memory? And for that, let's finally look to the solution, or a solution, because there's no, there's no one silver fits all bullet here, so. Uh, so to recap, we want to build a network of ideas in a player's or student's long-term memory, uh, but they have a bottleneck just figure this out. Um, a bottleneck of uh, four plus or minus one chunks in short-term working memory. So as a teacher or designer, uh, it's kind of like you're trying to build a little ship inside a bottle. Um, so how do we do that, build that ship inside the bottle? Uh, my proposal is to give your learner one connection at a time. No more, no less. And this should comfortably fit within our four plus or minus one chunks. Uh, one chunk for an old idea, uh, one chunk for the new idea you want to introduce, uh, a third chunk to let them make the connection, and then a fourth one in case they get distracted by their phone or something. Uh, so now let's see how this one connection at a time strategy was used in one of my favorite games of all time, and which I just learned talking to Naomi that you'll analyze to death already. But anyway, here it is, the famously complex puzzle, plot puzzler, Portal. Yeah. It's amazing, I love it. Oh, you can hear the little music, the portal music, it's great. Um, yeah, so the first thing to note is how minimalist portal is. Uh, and the minimalism not only, not only helps the story by reinforcing the atmosphere of the cold, sterile environment, uh, but also helps get rid of distractions so that 
your precious four plus or minus one chunks are saved for what really matters, thinking with portals. So in the very beginning of the game, you're first introduced to the player mechanic. We use the WAS, the keys to move around, mouse to look, familiar stuff. Then exactly one minute later, you're introduced to the portal mechanic. And then you're introduced to the connection, the whole core of the game. You can move through portals. Uh, now, remember when I said that even games that are famous for learning by doing actually first give you a, a bunch of learning by observation? Uh, so here's actually an example. Um, in Portal, despite portals being the main mechanic, you actually can't control the portals for the first two levels of the game. And even when you are finally introduced to the portal gun, is it animating? Is the video moving? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, you, you can't immediately pick up the portal gun. Uh, you first actually observe it by itself, spinning around and firing on its own. Monkey see before monkey do. Uh, so that's the first connection. Uh, then the in-game introduces cubes, and then cubes can be picked up by you, and then you can go through portals, then it introduces energy pellets, then the connection, they can kill you, they can go through portals, and they can be deflected by cubes, poor companion cube. And finally, the game introduces turrets, they can kill you, they can go through portals, they can be knocked over by cubes, and they can be... <laughs> this was not intentional. <laughs> it can be knocked over by energy pellets. Yeah, you've never seen... Like, you've never seen Portal analyzed as a pentagram before, have you? Huh? <laughs> Cindy one, hailing Satan for game design. <laughs> Thank you, Satan. Um, I mean, how, how are you going to draw a diagram of five things connected? Like, seriously, like, there's no other way to connect them. Jeez. It's not intentional, I swear. Okay, anyway. And also, in the in-between sections of the game, uh, in between them um, <laughs> presenting <laughs> new, new connections, uh, it also gives you ample opportunities to practice. <laughs> Let me just switch slides. <laughs> to practice and strengthen your connections in long-term memory. So that's the fuck up. <laughs> so that's connection. <coughs> so that's how you build a ship in a bottle. Um, by focusing on just one new connection at a time, they can fit through the <laughs> four plus or minus one bottleneck and to build up bigger and bigger networks in long-term memory. And this actually reminds me of a popular practice in both education design and game design, which is this. If a learner is here at some point along a skill, a, a skill spectrum, uh, you should put the next challenge uh, here, just slightly beyond the learner's reach. In game design, uh, matching skills with challenge is called flow. In educational philosophy, it's called scaffolding. So what, did I just spend this whole talk uh, proving something we already knew? Uh, well, yeah. Uh, and it's good to actually see the proof, uh, to sh know the evidence behind our practices rather than take it on hearsay. Uh, but I think it's more than just the proof. Uh, because see, the problem with just saying put the challenge slightly beyond is, well, uh, where is slightly beyond? Uh, the old design philosophies don't give you any guidance of where slightly beyond is. Uh, so you just have to go on trial and error. Uh, but I hypothesize, and this is my own conjecture, um, hasn't been empirically validated, uh, my hypothesis is that the ideal gap for a learner is exactly one connection away. That is the ideal distance, my conjecture. Uh, th the width of uh, our working memory's bottleneck, four plus or minus one chunks. So let's see one more concrete example, um, this time from an educational thing that I made. Um, this was an explorable explanation called called The Evolution of Trust. Um, it's a game about game theory. Um, there's a little payoff matrix, we got some rewards, we got two players, it's great. Um, and it's about how game theory can help us understand the distrust in our world, the distrust of institutions, of the news, of each other, and how maybe it can help us uh, find a way for trust to evolve again. Uh, this time is not gonna be a pentagram. <laughs> okay. Sorry, sorry for corpsing back there. Not professional, very not professional. It's free, you get what you, you, get what you pay for. <laughs> so the game uh, starts with a true story about the Christmas truce between uh, 
During World War I, in 1914, there was a series of widespread ceasefires between the British and German uh, trench lines. On Christmas Day, uh, both sides put down their guns, they got out of the trenches, and exchanged gifts on Christmas. Wow. Then the game, uh, my game talks about trust in general, especially about trust in the world right now. And it makes a connection. It makes a contrast. Why is it that they could build trust in a time of official wartime while we're lacking trust right now in something that is officially peacetime? Um, to answer that, I introduce game theory and the game of Prisoner's Dilemma. Um, and which is a simple mathematical model of trust. That's the connection. Um, I actually did not connect Prisoner's Dilemma to the Christmas truce, although like in hindsight I should have. Instead, I introduced Iterator Prisoner's Dilemma, which is simply um, two players playing the game of Prisoner's Dilemma over and over again. Um, and that is connected to the Christmas truce because uh, trenches are different from like other kinds of warfare because in trench warfare, you play against the same opponent over and over again. Um, and so, the, so repeat interactions are a unique feature of trench warfare, and they're also a unique feature of, and repeat interactions are necessary for trust in general. <coughs> Next, I introduce evolutionary game theory uh, by showing how iterated prisoner's dilemma can evolve over time, and how, and this explains why the Christmas truce uh, evolved independently amongst like several different independent trenches, um, and can explain how trust or distrust can evolve today. Um, finally, I introduced the possibility of making mistakes. Uh, what if you intended to help someone, but you accidentally hurt them? Uh, this has consequences for the iterated prisoner's dilemma, um, affects the evolution of the game, and affects the evolution of trust in our world today. So in hindsight, there were a lot of connections I could have made, but I totally missed. Uh, I made the evolution of trust uh, before I had this cognitive psychology framework, uh, but next time, I'm definitely going to try to make those connections. So at the beginning of my explorable explanation, uh, the player starts with, as a total novice at game theory, but by the end of my game, they are a whole 1% closer to being, you can see, can you, 1% <laughs> right, closer to actually being able to do game theory, which is not bad for like a half hour long thing. Uh, but it makes me wondering after repenting for my sins against science <laughs> with the pentagram, <laughs> I guess. Um, next time, maybe I could use cognitive science and this one connection at a time framework uh, to help folks go even further, uh, to gain a deeper understanding of our world, of systems. Maybe, that's, that, that's the hope. Um, and that's why today I wanted to teach cognitive psychology to you, uh, so I can teach cognitive psychology to myself. Preparing this talk was a learning activity that was a suitable cognitive load for me. So, in conclusion, note to drink water. <coughs> in conclusion, we want, you want a network of ideas in your player or student's long-term memory but we have a bottleneck of only four plus or minus one chunks in our short-term working memory. Therefore, you should give your player or student one connection at a time. But you need to be beware of the expertise reversal paradox. Uh, therefore, you should know where your audience's skill level is and then give them a challenge that's just one connection away. Uh, also, if you want to take a photo to just remind you of a summary of this talk, this is the summary slide. This is, this is everything. Uh, and now I'm going to ramble a bit more so you have more time to take a photo if you wanted to. <laughs> also, I guess I could send you a PDF of the slides or something. That, yeah, I'll, I'll do something like that later. Um, so the big takeaway for you aspiring game designers, uh, before you design any of your levels, first think about the network of mechanics that you want to share. You don't have to draw as a pentagram, just draw some network. Um, then design your levels in such a way that each section gives a challenge, each section of your, each level gives a challenge that is just one connection away. And the big takeaway for you educational designers, uh, before you design your lesson, think about the network of ideas you want to share. How do they all connect? Then give instructions, monkey see, or practice problems, monkey do, uh, that give your students a mental challenge that is, again, one connection away. All right, you're all done taking photos? Okay, next slide.
So if you want to learn more about cognitive psychology, uh, this was how I first got started. Um, uh, so if you want to learn about cognitive psychology, especially applied to the classroom, this is a book I highly recommend. Uh, Why Don't Students Like School by Daniel T. Willingham. Um, this is where I learned about, first learned about the expertise reversal effect, and actually this is where I got that cool two different lists um, demonstration, although they used a different one that had sports acronyms and I totally didn't get it. <laughs> um, so it's a very friendly overview of the science of learning and has lots of practical advice. Uh, so yeah, it's good stuff. Learning. <laughs> when you were a baby, uh, you had no fear of failure. You literally fell on your face uh, several times to try to learn how to walk. You babbled pathetically uh, to try to learn language. Learning's not just something you do for a transcript or a resume. It's part of us. It's super cheesy and earnest, but I hope the science that I've shared with you today uh, can help you and help you help your players or students uh, get in touch with that most deeply human part of ourselves, that innate, des powerful desire to learn. Thank you. Oh, that's good. That's very convenient. It can, it can I could also scream. <laughs> <laughs> that is better. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like the notebook. Oh, the notebook. 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 Yes. Cheers. Yeah. Cheers. <laughs> I. Uh, what do you? What do you carry? I carry a, 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 a Muji dot grid. I found this is the cheapest thing I could find at Blix. <laughs> oh. <okay. laughs> well then, I think that beats me. Uh, Hello. Is this oh, th these we have to these Hi. we have to hold close. Okay. Hold very very close to our mouths. Um, so thank you so much. You yeah, know, I, thank I, you I, for inviting me. Well, we're it's it's that it's it's so amazing to have you here. You know, I I think that hearing you lecture is so much like reading your reading slash playing your explorable explanations, which is that you take us along on a journey, right? That you ju just like tonight when you had. You had an idea, then maybe the idea doesn't work, but then you found a resource, and then you said, hey, maybe I can think about it this way. And you, you kind of reconstruct your own cognitive process, in a sense, as the model for how we learn as we, as we listen to you. And I think that I've always, one of the things that I do tell my students is that every game designer is an educator, even if you don't teach game design, because you are teaching them how to play your game, the language of your game, how exactly. they're going to find a meaningful experience. So, so I, 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 this is one of the reasons why your work is so fascinating because you're bridging these ideas of learning even before you started thinking about cognitive science and learning specifically and game design and really design writ large in a way that, that is sort of so intuitive and natural and interesting. So anyway, the, tonight's talk really fit fit right into that. So oh, thank you. Thank you so much. You know, I wanted to, so I wanted to start by asking you a little bit about your process. How, but you've done you 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 do these work. I know that you're you are um, you are uh, you you have a Patreon yes. page. Yes, so I even those, posted on the last slide. Yes, yeah, so those of you that want to support support Nikki and Nikki's <laughs> work, <laughs> join join the Patreon. I, it's okay. I can say it. It's okay. Thank uh, you for begging on my behalf. <laughs> uh, so well, I mean, I actually I admire your all of your works are are Creative Commons. License and available to Creative public. Commons Zero. Com Creative Commons Zero. Zero, zero rights reserved. Yes, you, can, you, you people can make money from them and not add right. them to public you. Public domain. Yes, I love it. Um, so, and you, but, and you, and you also do. You also do. Uh, you're often a you, sort of a scholar in residence at different programs, right? You've done some amazing things. Uh, I drift. As well. Yes, yeah, you I do. Drift. Yes, from context <laughs> to context. Um, but what is your process like in terms of? How these explorable explanations come to be? Or do you get interested in a in a, in a in a topic? Does it is it a sort of a like a kind of a research process? Or how? Uh, I'd love to hear a little bit more, and I'm sure the audience would too, about about how you develop them. Uh, first, I stand in the shower for five hours until ideas come, and then they do, and it's great. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, I'm trying to think of I guess like more speci like a specific explorable. Uh, I guess what I do like when I'm so as I'm making projects, like what I'm doing now, like on the side, I also like keep on learning. So like, you know, 
Um, so I never, or so I try my best not to get into fully work mode because I also want to like, you know, well, one, have a social life, uh, and two, also to keep learning as I go because learning is building the, to, to use more crappy metaphors, it's like, it's like the, the fertilizer, you know, for, for, for future ideas. It's, it's the crap from which uh, plants will spring. <laughs> um, so yeah, like, uh, I guess like, uh, for example, yeah, for evolution of trust, uh, like, I was just like, uh, like I, I, I read the book, it was based off of um, The Evolution of Cooperation by Robert Axelrod, mm -hmm. um, a whole, like, I think a year and a half before I actually made Evolution of Trust, and I wasn't even thinking about making it, it an explorable explanation. Like, I just, I'm curious, I just read stuff, and read stuff, watch stuff, uh, try out stuff, and, and I guess like in the back of my mind, I'm like, oh, maybe I can make a game out of this, but I try not to force it too much, because it's, yeah, yeah, you do what you want to force it. And actually, a coolest example uh, I just came to mind is the, uh, I made one on alternative voting systems. Um, I actually learned the basics of that like 10 years before I even made an explorable about it. Uh, I think the 2016 election might have been a bit of an impetus right, that, uh, that, that to finally make it. That percolated for a while. Yeah. yeah, so I guess like it's kind of just like building a bunch of stuff, like learning a bunch of stuff, like kind of have it all in your long-term memory little call back there um, and they just kind of like collide around uh, I find that the shower is like the best place for like random ideas to start colliding for other folks it might be like sitting in the couch or watching the stars or watching Netflix I don't know whatever like whatever works for you to have like those like ideas in long-term memory kind of like it's kind of like a like a hadron collider for ideas just like find something that just collides stuff together and then do you do you prototype do you have people yes. sort of play through rough versions, or how, how, how do the actual projects develop? Uh, yeah, so yes, uh, my poor suckers of friends uh, play through the incredibly crappy first drafts. Okay. Uh, so, so yeah, like, I guess like what I do is, uh, so yeah, I guess like, yeah, I try to come up with like both the story and the simulation sort of at the same time, and like the story of the simulation and uh, so forth. And actually this is a really cool tip uh, I learned from this uh, talk that um, the South Park guys gave. Okay. Um, so they had this like a uh, rule about like storytelling is that if your story is this happened and then this happened and then this happened, your story sucks. Um, so one thing they try to do explicitly is have their stories go, this happens, therefore this happens, but this happens, therefore this happens. Uh, and it's actually very suited for simulations uh, because in a simulation, like, every, like because it's so mechanical, uh, so for example, like in Parable of the Polygons, um, you know, we have agents that are, have a very small amount of bias, but in aggregates, they can be, they can create massive amounts of segregation, um, but, and then so on and so forth. Uh, and actually, you saw that I did therefore and butting at the end of my slide. I was like, we want a long term memory network, but it's a small bottleneck. Therefore, it should be one connection at a time. But there's the expertise reversal effect. Therefore, you should uh, have one, have the gap one connection away from where they currently are. I see. Are. So you really, I mean, you, on your website, you call yourself a storyteller, right? That is one way that you think about what you do. I don't have a bio on my website. I should but kind of put there, that but there. But there, there is a <laughs> phrase that you use I tell. I tell oh, stories. I tell systems. stories about systems. About I systems, tell right. the systems about stories. Right, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> That's exactly it. And so what's interesting is that is that you are actually using narrative thinking in an interesting way. That you have, you know, that you have uh, there is a kind of a narrative flow and this kind of forward, forward and back step. And I, I actually think at the at the beginning of your talk you said um, you said, well, I've got these other things like the coming out simulator, and that doesn't really have anything to do with what we're talking about tonight. But I think maybe it does. Maybe it does. I think maybe it does. You know, the, there's an interesting, um, uh, we, I, I told you this right before the talk started, but there's a group of MFA students that proposed a systems thinking independent study. So we've been reading, <laughs> yes, Edda's at Dan, Danny's there oh, hey. uh, in that group as well. We've, we've been uh, reading books like uh, Danella Meadows, Thinking yes. in Systems. We, Good old Slinky. Yes, we, we just finished Marvin Minsky's um, uh, Society oh, of Mind. That's been all, I really want to read that, but yes. I, can't, I can't check that out at the Boston Public Library. It's like in library use uh, only. I'll lend you what my copy. Hell? Why is it in library use only? I, I, can, I can lend you my copy. 
Really? Yes. Um, the, um, the, the, uh, the, but soci you. society of mind is so linked to the sort of your way of thinking about, even your way of visualizing cognition. It struck me as, yeah, there's something, something very interesting there, interesting connection there. Um, and, but I, I think what's interesting is that I'm, I wanted to ask you about if you feel like there is behind your work as a whole a kind of a model of, of, of a self or, or who we are as people. Because I think what's interesting is that you do have a kind of constructivist notion of you want to really get down into the granular sense of how how people interact, how systems work, the sort of the, the kind of the, the the very radical abstraction of people into polygons and adjacency into people moving into neighborhoods. But you you never leave it that simple, right? You you then reconnect it to to to, to kind of bigger social issues, to, to issues of identity. And I think that maybe there's a connection there even to the the coming out simulator. Mm -hmm. that I, so I'm curious, I wanted to ask you to kind of maybe bridge your kind of more mathematical constructivist work with this kind of narrative thinking. Um, do you feel like there's an interesting model of like how you're approaching representation of people, representation of culture within your work as a whole? Uh, so I guess the interesting thing about I guess like seeing any like creators' work is that it's here's so here's the secret. Every art that, that creators make is basically like the therapy session. People just trying to like trying to figure out what the hell they are about, and uh, I'll let you know when I figure that out. Um, <laughs> Yeah, but um, uh, so I guess like there's many trains of thought going at the same time here. Um, so I think yes, the, the I feel like yeah, like narrative and like simulations and like you know, like we think of like narrative as this like super fluffy or like in the popular mindset, it's like thought of this like like romantic, right? Or like if you're a more scientific type or like analytical type, you'd be like it's fluffy. Story is that stuff that. You know that, that BuzzFeed people use, right? right? Or even in the in the or even in the game world, people sometimes say, "Oh, there's narrative games, and then there's sort of gamey games, or you know, more complex or action-oriented games." Right. right. Oh yeah, that that leader narrative similar, dissonance. Right. Yeah. A similar, a similar a similar kind of distinction. Yeah, but I feel like as I mentioned earlier, with the whole uh, that uh, what the South Park people said about um, like story, I feel like the that the intersection between story. I feel like story and like understanding the world uh, in a rigorous way, like have come from the same, I think, human capability of understanding causality. Uh, as like they mentioned, like, you know, a good story is this, therefore that, but this, so on and so forth. Uh, and actually that reminds me, like Pixar, like well, at least one of this Pixar story writer had an interesting uh, similar formula for story, which is like, once upon a time, this, therefore this, but one day this, therefore this, but that. So yeah, it's a nice little connection there. So like, I feel like at its core, like story and uh, rationality uh, are like, both come from the same human drive and capacity to understand causality. Um, yeah, so I guess it's like, so I guess like that's the super analytical um, uh, connection between story and uh, systems, which right. is understanding causality. And I guess the story is showing causality uh, as implemented by humans, people with goals and desires and beliefs, and and seeing how they screw up. And sometimes, sometimes they don't screw up. Sometimes they get a happy ending. Well, exactly. But that's why I think it's not. We don't have to frame it as a super analytical idea because causality. I mean, there is causality in mathematics, right? You apply a formula to a set of numbers and they change. But causality is also how we find meaning in the world. Yes. Right? How we explore the world, how we interact with other people, how we discover who we are. Yeah. So, so this idea of causality is actually saying that bridges, we don't, it doesn't necessarily have to be an analytical concept, right? Yeah. And actually that just reminds me, yeah, that causality, like the question that people ask in causality is why? Which is the same question behind like, the romantic feelings of like what is meaningful and fulfilling in life, but also like the more scientific and analytical, like why does this happen? Like why why this this cause this? Like both in the romantic and classical logical sense, like it's that same question that is driving us. Why? Right. And but but I guess. but <laughs> this is but that but that's exactly why I think games are actually a really interesting context for exploring these issues, because the atoms of games are causality. I would argue, or let's say one way of thinking about games. There's obviously yes. many ways of thinking about games. No oh, silver, one, one, fits, one silver fits all bullet, yes. yes. Thank you for that, yes. You thank that for. Uh, thank you, Nikki. <laughs> the, so, 
What I mean is that y you do something in a game or you're playing with a system, and what it means to play with that system is to observe what happens as a result. You're pushing and pulling against the boundaries of the system. You're playing with how, how the system works. So, so uh, this is why I feel there is, a, there is a kind of a special linkage between the notion of games and, and the work that you do in terms of trying to think about causality in this very granular way, even as you're bridging it to narrative and to, to the world outside of games and systems. Yes. Yes. <laughs> that was not a question, but yes. yes. Well, that's a... That's a um, I, I do, though, want to talk to you about games as learning contexts. Because... Context? Well, as games as special contexts for learning. Okay. Because I think you know that there's, there's a lot of interest, there's a lot of excitement around this idea that games can be special ways that people learn. Yes. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious what you think about that. Because a lot of that, there's, there's so many problems, right? There's a, a sort of conventional Math idea. Math blasters. Yeah, the games, yeah, that either the gameplay is, the, it's the chocolate covered broccoli model, right? And there's also the idea that the, the value of games is to inject you with information, which is, that, you know, yeah. which is not really what they're good at doing necessarily. So what do you think about this? I mean, you obviously, are, you're making what you sometimes call educational games, these explorable explanations, explorations. That's actually a, a mouthful. Try, try saying that in front of a crowd. Yeah, it is. Which is like, in fact, like when we got the Slack name, like it couldn't even, even fit in the subdomain, so it had to be explorableexplanation.slack.com. Oh. It's just, just <laughs> so oh. close. We can't get the Twitter handle, explorable explanations. It's, yeah, long names is kind of my thing. Anyway, um, uh, what was the question? <laughs> well, how do you feel about games and learning? Like, what, what's, your, what's your take on all of these people like, so interested and hot on this idea of, of looking at the intersection of, uh, of games and learning? It should not be math blasters. <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, as you mentioned, like, yeah, the chocolate-covered broccoli is like a really good metaphor to describe like, how a lot of people approach educational games. Oh, I guess like, Maybe it's a bit of a straw man at this point, but you know, right. it's a straw man worth beating up because it still exists. It's still there. Um, uh, so yeah, the, the idea is you know, the games, is, the games is the chocolate, and the broccoli is the education that's good for you, kid. Just right. eat it. But we shouldn't have the chocolate covered broccoli. We should learn how to roast our vegetables. You know, like add a little lemon zest and peppers to bring out the flavor that is in the vegetable itself. Right. 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 I think that is, that, I have not heard that. That is the perfect antidote to the chocolate broccoli metaphor. And also it sounds actually genuinely tasty. It actually tasty. sounds delicious. Yes, it does. And I actually, you've perked my appetite up a little bit. With yeah, that. it's like, what time is it? By, like dinner by, time. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so how would that apply to actually games and learning? Uh, so yeah, uh, I guess like, yeah, as I mentioned, like, yeah, learning is, is intrinsically fulfilling. Like, we love learning. That's why games uh, are, I mean, like, okay, again, like, yeah. Bartle's taxonomy, not everyone's into games for learning, some are there for expression or socializing. Okay, but one function of games, and why reason people really love games is uh, learning. And, and even like in education, like whenever I watch like a TED talk or like some particularly like well done like nonfiction book, um, that thrill of like, aha, now I understand a new thing, that is intrinsically motivating, it's as intrinsically uh, like fulfilling as like a breath of fresh air or like a good delicious broccoli that is roasted with a little zest and no it's like it's intrinsically fulfilling um so we, how do you bring out the best of that fulfillment and learning and i think yeah the basic standard like game design techniques of like um gift the player enough but also like let them solve it by themselves um so as i mentioned like yeah, a challenge that's like one connection away like give them the stuff give them just just enough but then to actually yeah give them the two pieces you know, chunk one and chunk two, but then they have to make the connection for themselves, the one connection. Um, Andrew, what's his last name, uh, from Pixar, um, had, a really, had a really good um, quote about this, but he applied it to storytelling, but I feel like it applies to the same two games and learning, um, is he said that the audience wants to work for their meal, like the, the audience like wants to have the aha moment of themselves. So his saying was, Give the audience two and two, not four. Let them, like, like don't give them, f yeah, let, let, give them two plus two and let them figure out four for themselves. Um, I, I would give an example, I was about to give an example for Breaking Bad, but that would have been spoilers, so. <laughs> yeah. But I think that's so interesting because it's true that games do that really well, that games give, um, uh, games on an interactive level give you know, two plus two to the player and let them put it together. 
but often in games, the uh, uh, the narrative component of games is the opposite. That that the narrative, That's a good you know, that the narrative component of games is often trying trying so hard. And I once found this when I was collaborating with a with a with a screenwriter on a film that as a game designer it's actually really hard to communicate things to the player and we would be so obvious that we would, you know, we have, our instinct is to make sure that characters are extremely clear about, about what they're doing and, you know, and, and so that's why you see sort of cutscenes where a character says, and now I'm providing this information and my current emotion is angry and I'm really angry and I want you to know that I'm angry rather than, I don't know, something understated. Like they sort of give a, give a glance and look away and then we have to kind of, Put, put it together yeah. what that means, right? The way a film might, where, where, where there's a much lighter touch. So it's interesting that games, that games do provide the lighter touch when it comes to causality of mechanics, but we're not, we haven't learned that lesson yet when it comes to actually the, the, the stories that we tell. In, in yeah. a gen, I'm generalizing. Yeah, but. no, that's actually a really cool connection I haven't thought about before. And like, I guess like, yeah, if the, if, okay, one, that's cool that you collaborated with a screenwriter, but like, I also like, uh, yeah, I guess like screenwriters and, or like storytellers and game designers work together, like, like storytellers could like show like how causality works in a story world, because story writers think about they do think about causality all the time. Like, if like if, like oh like you know when people say like oh that character totally acted out of character, they're right. thinking about causality. They're thinking like right. given my mental model of this character's beliefs and values, this is likely and this is not likely. Like people have this intuitive sense of characters because we have that intuitive sense with people, um, hopefully. Um, and so, yeah, like transferring, and I feel like, yeah, the same lessons of like causality and like, like, like giving just enough information that people can like figure out the causality for themselves, right. like does hopefully transfer between like game mechanics and story and from story to game mechanics. I feel like at least that's helped uh, for, for my work, which is kind of straddling that intersection. I think so, yeah. I, I, I mean, I think what's really nice about your explorable explanations as narrative. We can say explorables for short. Okay, but I said it right this time. I didn't stumble. You sure that. did. Yes. <laughs> right. Explanable let's, blow ablations. Let's just. We can end the lecture here. I've, I've got it out of my system. So that the um, I but but that that you you kind of you interweave them so so effortlessly. I, I there's I, a lot I, of effort. Yeah, well, <laughs> but that it comes off. It comes off as it comes off again. So. So so playful and so you really bring us along for what feels like your your uh, your journey of creativity. At the, in in one of your slides, you said that um, in the evolution of trust, you feel like you get us one percent towards understanding game theory. So I want to challenge you on that a little bit because I, I I mean I don't know what the, what what a hundred percent would be like. We have a PhD in mathematics on you know our dissertation <laughs> is on. On game theory or something like that. So, uh, B. John Nash. Yes, exactly. <laughs> but I, I feel like um, I feel like what's interesting about about your work is that you're not you're not about trying to make us experts in something. But what you are doing is making connections between the, your subjects and things on the outside. And so, mm -hmm. I, I, much like your diagrams, like in the evolution of trust. I think what elevates it, in in part, there's other things too, but what elevates it beyond just a uh, sort of interactive tutorial on on basic game design theory is that you frame it by the story about about World War One trenches, right? Mm -hmm. And that you're saying, well, there there are, there are real world contexts for this, and then you also end it by saying, well, how how does this apply to the way that we interact in our world today? And that that what would it mean to trust someone or not trust someone? So it strikes me that that um, you know what? What what you provide us with? I think Marvin Minsky called a concept a thing to think with, like a concept is sort of a tool. So it's not necessarily that your goal is to make us masters of game theory, but that you're using that maybe then yeah. we can we can apply game theory to other other areas and make connections between them, and all and or apply that kind of style of thinking to other things as well. Yeah, and that's like, uh, sorry, there are just three changes of thought coming at one at the first time. Um, so the first part is, yes, and that's actually something I really want to do in my future work. Uh, so like, this talk was like partially confessional, but also like partially me trying to figure out what I want to do for my pre future projects. And I feel like for future projects, well, after my anxiety game coming out at the end of April, um, is uh, I want to create stuff that helps people like transfer like systems thinking, game theory to like, uh, more outside stuff, like explicitly, like help them build that skill. Um, 
So we'll, we'll see if that works. Uh, second thing is I do want to give credit. Um, so the evolution of trust is based off Robert Axelrod's uh, book, The Evolution of Cooperation. Right. Um, and in that book, he was the one who created, uh, who made a connection between the World War I trenches and uh, iterated prisoner's dilemma. Um, I, however, I also added some stuff about you know trust today and like right. social media. Social media is full of like one-off interactions. Right. So like that's some like some new stuff, new connections I made. Right. But uh, the, the trenches story was uh, was his. Um, I had a third train of thought, but it's gone now. Um, yeah, and I and I guess okay. So I will. I'll uh, I'll uh, I'll I'll drive a new train out of the station out of uh, the uh, metaphors. Yes, I don't <laughs> think that metaphor worked by the way. But um, <laughs> I I. Um, uh, I think that I, I keep on thinking about the connections between your kind of mathematical work and coming out simulator, um, which for those of you that, that haven't played it is, is, is a, in some ways it's very similar. You feel like you're exploring a system. It's a conversational system. The characters are very self-conscious and comment on the fact that, you know, especially in the framing narrative, uh, the fact that you have choices and you're making choices and this is an interactive game. But it's an extremely personal story and very kind of a felt story about this, uh, I, I guess, semi-autobiographical uh, yeah. uh, experience of coming out to your family. Mm -hmm. um, it, but it, Spoiler, it, it sucked. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I do feel like, I do feel like um, that is also maybe one of these examples of how you are applying this kind of rigorous, often sort of scientific design systems thinking to things outside of games and outside of mathematics. Yeah, that's an interesting connection. I guess maybe that might, that, I guess like, I guess I didn't come across. In, I guess I guess I wasn't intending to right. to do that. But I guess like just like my own background in. Uh, I just really like math and uh, <laughs> systems, and I guess that just like comes across in uh, even in when I'm trying to make right. a story. I'm like, oh, just a little bit of systems right here. Right, right. Uh, and actually, yeah, my my uh, next game on anxiety disorder, uh, which will also be in the same uh, vein as Coming Out Simulator, uh, it's going to be a conversation-based fighting game uh, between a human and their anxiety. You play as the anxiety. Uh, and this, yeah, it's actually gonna have that system. Like, always they have like a semblance of, at least they use the kind of like the frame of like, it's a fighting game system. Um, so, yeah, just again, like a causality. Right. And I guess like I make the causality like a lot more, like a lot, I guess like, yeah, every story, well, 99% of stories like have that, core of the causality. Mm. Um, some make the causality more explicit than others. Uh, I guess like uh, my, my approach, because of my background, experiences, and preferences, like it makes the, the causal system like m more, more obvious. Right, yeah, but that's exactly what's so interesting because when, when, when we're talking about the sort of the conventional game narrative, again, not all the time, but often there's a sense of wanting to paper over the system and the causality, right? So what's, what's so interesting mm. about coming out simulator is that it's clearly a narrative game. There are characters, there's dialogue, they're talking, it's very stylized interaction, but there's not, it's a very felt narrative. It, it feels very authentic as you're playing it, but there's zero attempt to, to sort of illusionistic or escapist or quote unquote immersive idea of somehow removing the idea that we're interacting with it or that it's a system or that there's causality that, that should be behind the scenes. That there's, rather than, a, than either or, with, with interactivity and narrative pulling in either directions, it's a yes and, right? The, we, we, we're getting both and they're kind of in this, in this wonderful, um, playful dance, right, together as, as you interact with it. So it's, 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 there's something very magical about that, I think, working so well in that project. That's a lot more thought than I put into it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, maybe we should open it up to, uh, to questions from the audience. Yes, we already have a hand. Sure. Hi. Um, Hi, what's your name? I'm Ryan. Hi, Ryan. I'm Nikki. Hi. <laughs> um, some like, really awesome educational experiences can be really, really disorienting, like being dropped in a country, you don't speak the language, or seeing yeah. this painting for the first time, or like seeing a movie like Memento, where Oh, that was a good one. <laughs> I'm wondering if you could talk a little, because a lot of your work is about uh, designing learning and playing experiences where you sort of know what the hell's going on. I was wondering if you could talk about maybe what you think about 
learning experiences might still be beneficial, but you don't know what the hell's going on. Do I need to repeat Ooh. the question for the stream? Yes. Yes? yes? Okay, so, so uh, relating to experiences like Memento, for example, where, where there's really a sense of confusion and uh, 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 playing with time, how, uh, relating, relating that to um, this notion of games and learning and how you, sort of what your approach is and what you're thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, I think this question like, yeah, what is the benefit of like uh, experiences where, because I mentioned like about learning experiences where, uh, I talk about all, like, all learning experiences where you make sure the player like knows just enough, and like the next challenge is one connection away. But your question is, what about experiences where you just dropped into like a completely bizarre country town or like memento? Like we have no idea what the hell's going on. Is that the is that an accurate framing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Whew, I got it. Um, right. In other words, the, the, the kind like of... What's the, yeah, it, yeah, what are the it, benefits... This is another approach. Yeah, what are the benefits Disor of... Disorientation or chaos yeah. or... Yes. Can it be a benefit of being completely disoriented and having no idea what the hell's going on? Um, that's a good question. I think for, for story and art, uh, definitely, because uh, disorientation sometimes can be the point of like the whole mood. Um, a few years ago, I read House of Leaves, and what the fuck <laughs> is this... <laughs> Um, for learning, hmm. I there is one actually. Actually, oh, there was this really great uh, comic that explained um, uh, Mariam. Oh God, I can't pronounce her last name. I'm so sorry, Mariam. Uh, um, the the, 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 one the one set in Palestine. Yeah, uh, yeah the uh, the one who died recently at forty. Um, Mariam. Ma I'm so sorry, Lizzie. Please, please dub this over in the recording. <laughs> wait, wait, yeah. Um, this is a really great comic that I can't find anymore. Um, where it starts off with a super disorientating like explanation of her, her of her work. It's like one sentence that's like full of jargon, and it's super disorientating. But then it, the comic goes through step by step each term of the comic, and it explains this. Explains like, oh, what's yeah, what is topology? Imagine an ant on a donut, and it keeps going, and going, and then uh, finally at the end. It shows you the exact same thing that disoriented you before, and you totally get it. And that is, God, that was f amazing. And I can't find it anymore. And, and, and so yeah, I think that maybe that probably, that's probably one function you can use uh, disorientation for, like a, just a temporary bit of disorientation. Right. Well, it strikes um, me that that's one way of staying the one step ahead of your player or your learner or your student, right? Yeah, it, kind of like a teaser. Yes. Yeah, like kind of like, uh, I don't know, I'm thinking like, it was like Mega Man X two, the one where like you, 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 the, the one where Eagle Raptor did that video on it. Um, <laughs> well, games do this all the time. Yeah, the they one we got a teaser was like yes. the, like you, you know this big baddie is like starting to beat you up, and then like as, as you're about to lose your last health points, like someone saves you, and then like this person and the Zeno is like uh, is like, and one day you'll be as powerful as me, and like that's a teaser, right. and like maybe that could be like a function of disorientation. Is like this is super disorientating now. But by the end of this, you'll get it. Uh, another example that comes to mind, and this is probably a less good example because uh, it's from coding. I remember the first time I learned coding in school, they were like, hey, here's the Java Hello World program. <laughs> it's like 11 lines. <laughs> the, the public, static, void, main, string, square brackets, args, curly bracket, and it's like super disorientating, but by the end, you actually understand what this means. Right. I, I mean, the Hello World program should not be 11 lines long, but not, now I know. Well, even your example of the, the language with the X oh, yeah. and Fox, and right, it, it, that's a strategy of a little, a tiny smidgen of disorientation. Yeah, a disorientation for a teaser. I think that's maybe one function that I just made up right now. <laughs> uh, more questions. Yes, lots of questions uh, over here. Oh. <laughs> Hi, Tim. Thanks for your talk. It's awesome. Uh, do you have any thoughts about differentiation in your classroom? Like, how you find mm. the next piece of knowledge when all your students are at different places in their knowledge? Yeah, that is the toughest problem, I think. Well, one of many tough problems with, like, education is that with a game, or at least like, with a single-player game, like, you can easily tailor to a, 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 a player's... Uh, you know, uh, prior knowledge. Like one, they could be just like difficulty settings in the very beginning, or you could have dynamic difficulty curves, like the 
the, the game AI like figures out how much you suck and then like tones down the difficulty in a way that you can't tell. Or offers hints or... Yeah, or hints. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I, I actually don't, I'll admit that I don't know too much about like actual like in classroom educational design. So I, I'm, I'm sure like a lot of teachers have like um, ways to, you know, help the students who need more help or like allow the students uh, who are already advanced to like, you know, like skip ahead. Um, right. Yeah, it's a, it's a hard problem, and it's not solved. And especially, you know, just the economic constraints of, like, you, you have, like, a couple dozen, like, or, like, even up to 50 kids, like, in a single classroom, especially in, like, poor, poor, uh, poorer schools. It's, like, it, you, you, it's really hard to tailor. Like, you probably can't tailor it individually. I mean, that... But it's that, hard. It's hard... That, that, that kind of is one of the, the main challenges of teaching, right? Of yeah, actually, yeah, you're a teacher. Like, it, well, you, 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 why don't you answer this question? Why am I feeling this? Well, I, I mean, <laughs> I think that, I think that uh, we can't look to a game or technology or a piece of media really to solve that problem. In a sense, that the game or the media or the technology, that is the thing that a teacher might leverage in order to, to, to help uh, apply it in different ways to different students. And I think that that's what I, when I, I see uh, teachers doing that really well, it's, 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 like, it's like stage magic or something. That they even in, like a, in a dance class, there's someone and you realize that they're, then they're like telling a student, okay, you don't have to put in this step or you do this and then I want you to do this extra thing. And meanwhile, everyone is still moving around and continuing to. So that, that idea of juggling different levels of expertise. All of that said, there are some learning contexts like like your explorable explanations that explorables that uh, um, ding 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 that will um, that 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 are meant to be solo right. There's not a human being there that's right. facilitating them. But I do think that you build this in as well. You often, for example, leave little trails where you say you can keep on playing with this. You can keep on exploring oh, with this yeah. if you want, right? I forgot that so I did you, that, yeah. you actually, you actually in, in a sense, sort of side quests. Okay, if this isn't challenging you, spend a little bit more time to do this. So there's, or do you want to replay it? Or, or actually you failed? Actually, I think sometimes you can fail, twi quote unquote, fail twice, and then you actually give us a chance to move on, right? You also do that sometimes so that you don't have to necessarily <laughs> succeed at the highest level of a particular activity within an exercise. So, so, th yeah. th so fairly straightforward solutions like that often work as well. Yeah, actually that's yeah, super well said because you're actually a teacher so you probably know how to tell it to work. Well, we're uh, like, a, designers are educators. So we're yeah, all designers are educators. really the same and educators are designers yeah, as well. Not in a math blaster's way. We're going to just keep hitting that straw man <laughs> yes. over and over again. Mm, I just want some of that, that uh. lemon broccoli. That's what that's what's <laughs> on my mind. Uh, right. let's, take, let's take some more questions. Yeah, in the very back. Systems. Hi, uh, Zephron, thank you so much. Hi, Zephron. Sorry, what? How, what is Nikki Case's version of Fortnite? How are, how are you going to make it? How are you going to make the next Fortnite and and take over youth culture? I don't know. I thought Tetris ninety nine was the next Fortnite already. I, <laughs> <laughs> did you have, did you have more to your question, or or is it really you want to? Well, no, yeah, but that's well, that's actually it because I think that the importance of it is that we're actually engaging in one another as we're learning these lessons. You know, mm -hmm. there's a vacuum. Well, you know, in the theoretical, I might apply these lessons, and it's mind-blowing, but then it's like, okay, then you talk to your friends, and you're like, hey, I, you know, learned all this awesome stuff about you know, system design, and, you know, you should learn, too. Go play this game. Well, what about the game of, like, getting, you know, meta-textual with it a bit, but I think that that, you know, it's something to explore, and also just how to leverage the channels, because that's something that, like, the digital world has shown us it's possible, and then, but what yeah. only you have really shown so far is that we can take these complex information and lessons and really you know, put it in a way. Right. So, how is yeah. there is there thank a way you. to thank you? So yeah, much. thank you. That's a yeah. great question. Just so, just to restate for oh, the stream, uh, is is there a way to kind of bridge out and make do the sort of work that you're doing, but maybe for a much a much bigger audience that wouldn't be predisposed to to want right, to, to games. Yeah, to, to want yeah. or no, to want to sort of do one of these sort of explorables. Yes. Ding 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 ding. And that is a really good, really really good question. I my current publication strategy is put it on Twitter and Patreon and then 
<laughs> so uh, yeah, thinking about like strategy of like how, uh, and I like a frame of like the next fortnight because like, uh, you know, how do we get these kids to eat their broccoli without cutting it in chocolate, um, or you know, like uh, just like, like yeah, like um, like showing people that yeah, learning is not. A drill and kill. It's not staring at a textbook until your eyes start bleeding all over the page. Do you feel like Fort that, that would would you say that Fortnite is a good interesting model for learning? I haven't played. It. But you, I'm sorry. But do you? I'm but really maybe sorry. you you are you familiar with it or or let's say I, mass I know, market. I, I know it's misspelled. Okay, so I know it's not spelled like. Fortnite. <laughs> <laughs> so forget about Fortnite. Forget about Fortnite. <laughs> I guess there's different camps and games, right? So someone like James G, who studies games and learning, says, look, it's not about educational games. Any well-designed game is a context for, he calls it a, a practice for future learning. The games, games teach us how to learn. And so that he would say, yeah, a game like Pokemon or Yu-Gi-Oh, uh, a game like even Rainbow, like a stealth shooter type of game, it's teaching us things like collaboration and problem solving. Um, do, are you a, a also, do you feel that way, that sort of like even commercial, well-designed games, even if they don't have an educational mission, are, are valuable? Yeah, I mean, like, at the very least, you're learning how to play that game. Yeah, no, but that's not a sarcastic response. That's like, actually, like, you are actually learning a thing. Right. I, and even if it's like, not learning a mechanics, like if it's like a more story-driven game, or like if it's a game that's like purely expressive, you are like learning the characters in the world. I mean, like, like you, like if a thing changes in your long-term memory, that is technically learning, and that's great. Like, and just like any more, just just like um, how you know, uh, like just like pra I feel like practicing learning, just like practicing the general act of learning, like helps you. Okay, as soon as I say this, like probably like fact check me on like PolitiFact or Google Scholar or something. Uh, that just the act of like practicing learning, um, just like. Even in the game, like, or not even in the game, like, in, even in the game that's not intended to be educational, like, helps you get better at learning in general. Like, right. one specific causal mechanism for that maybe might be like a growth mindset. It's like, oh, I suck at this game now, but now I'm doing better. And like, I, I, I know that at least like for me, it felt like, like whenever I was like, I remember like in school, like whenever I was like stuck on a really, really hard problem, like one way I would motivate myself was like, I fucking finished N, I, I can do this. If I can finish N, I can, I, can, I can finish this problem. I did all 99 fucking levels from the Flash game. God, I broke a keyboard, it was great. Um, the, oh yeah, the other thing is another book recommendation, um, Free to Learn. Um, by Peter Gray. It's, uh, he is a psychologist and slash, yeah, yeah he, he's, he's a psychologist and he also like does some anthropology as well. Oh, he's taking notes, yeah. Free to play by Peter Gray. Um, free to play sorry, free to learn, I'm sorry. <laughs> free to learn. Free to play is it, a it, mobile it, yeah, I know, yeah, yes, yes. It's about play, but it's called Free to Learn. And I've mixed up the title several times. Free, free to Learn. Um, by Peter Gray. By Peter Gray. And it's, and he talks about like you know uh, how hunter gatherer kids um, learn entirely by by playing. They learn, yeah. They practice. You know, uh, they make little toy tools, and like this actually helps their uh, tool building skills in the future. They learn hide and seek, and actually, uh, so, and, and like he also like he's like Peter Gray's like talks about like the anthropology, psychology, and even like zoology of play. Because it turns out like um, most animals actually do have. I was like a lot of like mammals have a they do play tag in a sense they love play fighting they love um, you know being chased uh, actually just the interesting thing is that most mammals uh, when they play like a game of tag or chase animals actually prefer being the ones being chased uh, most of them including us like when they, like being it in a game of tag is the punishment right, that's right you're trying to you're trying to remove that get yeah. out of that mantle right yeah yeah that's being the, whole being point the, of the chaser game. is the punishment right. we are we actually enjoy being chased we may we may prefer being the the many rather than the one as well in that yeah, in that situation exactly as well. do you do you know the ambiguity of play by Brian Sutton Smith ah uh, no I don't that then that's that's a book for you because that you're that that yeah he he talks a lot about the um, uh, in part, some of uh, uh, what's the title? Uh, the ambiguity of play by Brian Sutton Smith. Brian Sutton. Brian Sutton Smith. He's a folklorist, and uh, he looks at he looks at play through a bunch of different lenses, but but some of them have to do with this uh, notion of, of animal play and um, mm. 
Anyway, the other, other stuff we could talk about, but I want to take Anyway, yeah, book recommendation, uh, Free to Learn by Peter Gray. It's all about play Thank and you. how we learn by it, and also how it's like really important for mental health. Like, like in the last uh, decade, um, the CDC has found like yeah, well, a, qu a quadrupling in like youth suicide and like, mm. like like five times more increase in like depression and anxiety. And Peter Gray's hypothesis is that it's related to a uh, decline in, in play, especially like social outdoor uh, uh, play. And like even, even when you account for play with video games and like play through video games, and like he ag agrees that this play as well is also beneficial. Right. Um, even then, that still does not make up for the lost play wow. that we have lost in the last yeah. few decades. Henry Jenkins also has written about that, the idea of uh, um, that that you know, fifty or hundred years ago, um, children played outside, and now they're yeah. playing. They're playing in front of their TVs. It's, it's it's a different kind of. Henry Jenkins actually makes the argument that these virtual spaces are kind of you know, as public space becomes less. Uh, accessible through yeah, helicopter like parenting or through a lack of like safety. It's illegal to like let your kid right. like take the exactly. subway back. Right. Like, wasn't right. that the whole like story in New York where like some uh, like mom let her kid take the subway back and then she got in trouble with the cops or something? Wow. But yeah, I don't know. <laughs> but it sounds likely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's interesting. I think I think what's interesting, and then we'll send it back out to some more questions. Oh, yeah. Sorry. With yeah. No. No. Derailing. No. No. Is that? I mean, what's I think what's interesting is when we talk about these things like play and learn. They are cultural concepts, and that's, that's actually what's so fascinating about the ambiguity of play, that Brian Seth Smith says play is a concept that's brokered and, and trafficked within culture, and that often we, we think of play as being, it's a way for children and animals to evolve, right? But that's, to, to, their cognitive skills or social skills, that's just one of a dozen ways that he, that he thinks about play in the book. This idea of play as progress, he calls it. Th these different rhetorics of play. There's also play as transgression. There's the play of the self. There's the oh, play as cool. sort of resistance against, a high, against an, a, an authority structure. He, he ties it to Franz Fanon's idea of post-colonial kind of resistance. It's a super interesting oh, that's really cool. You're yeah, going to get a kick out of it. Yeah. Let's go on. Uh, yes. You've had your arm like three, okay. hands, three times up. Danny, oh. from the systems thinking uh, uh, reading group, must better be good. Oh, boy. Um, <laughs> my question is just about uh, the target audience you think of when you're making explorables and whether or not when you're thinking of the target audience or who you're making it for, if that idea has changed since learning about the expertise or personal mm. paradox at all. Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, I, I guess like my answer before learning all this would have been Whenever I make an explorable, I kind of make it for myself from one year ago, or like myself from before I learned it. Hmm? Oh, thank oh, you very right. much. You're right. So yeah. who is it? Thank you very much, uh, stream <laughs> reminder person. Uh, the explorables are done for who? Talk a little bit about the audience yeah. that you have. Well, well, yeah. What is the target audience I have in mind? Who am I aiming for with my bow and arrow of explanation? <laughs> um, I guess I'm aiming for myself uh, from a year ago. At least that, that sounds was my dangerous, that <laughs> metaphor. <laughs> yes, I live dangerously. Um, so, and then I guess, uh, yeah, I guess that's, I guess like in the very beginning, I wasn't even thinking about audience. Like I was thinking, oh yeah, general audience. <laughs> Who's that? Um, but yeah, I guess like recently I've been thinking like, oh, I want to make something to help people who are like who I was um, like a few years ago. Um, people who like, you know, are curious and like are willing to put up with half an hour of whatever I'm about to throw at them, but just don't happen to know this project, this, this topic. They're, they're, they're a lay person, but you know, I, you know, I, yeah, they're, they're a lay person, but they're, they're curious and they're, they're willing to do some. Yeah, and uh, that's, I think that that's, work. we haven't talked about it, but that's almost the sort of journalistic bit. Uh, a vector of your work, right? I think that's a that's how a journalist might think about a long, you know, a long form piece that they might write on a particular topic as well. Yeah, and uh, it's actually a really good question about like how this would change uh, my like after like learning about the whole cognitive science of psychology, cognitive psychology, like how that would change who I try to aim my uh, projects for, because. Uh, I haven't thought about that until now. Um, so, and I guess the other consideration I'm thinking about is like, another problem, I, this is not really related, but like another problem I've had is like, with the whole like aiming for a general audience is that it feels super abstract. It's like, who am I really making this for? It just like feels really demotivating. It's like, all right, time to make it for a faceless internet audience so the number goes up. Right. And if I make it for myself in the past, it feels really narcissistic. Mm. So like, I'm trying to like figure out like, who can I make 
who can I make? What can I, who for what, for whom <laughs> can, can I make uh, my projects? And actually the anxiety disorder project, uh, I feel like has been really motivating as my work on this one because like, I have a very specific mm. set of people I'm making this for. It is for my friends with anxiety disorder. Mm. Uh, I mean, like, you know, who like me have this, right. uh, this problem, it's a problem. So, like, I'm, I, sp I specifically have them in mind as I'm making that. Right. So maybe in the future I can think about who are my friends who are one connection behind um, what I want to, or like several connections behind what I want to teach, and then very specific friends, or like, or, or people I can think hold in mind, and then make an ex that, that was one of your friends one step behind stumbling over a chair in yeah. the market. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, so maybe uh, that's that. Uh, maybe we have time for one or two more questions. Um, who's had their hand up longest? I think you have. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, first off, love your work. Oh, thank, thank you. What's your name? Alan. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> and I think it also has a lot to do with journalism and the future of reading, so thank you. Hmm. Um, a ton of questions, but I'll narrow it down to one. You mentioned causality earlier. That seemed to be a concern or an interest. Uh, have you checked out or... Uh, Judea pearls. Judea pearls. Yes. Yes, I have. And there's even this part... So the, so the question was oh, sorry, for the yes. stream <laughs> about causality. Have you, have you looked at... at a, a, I guess there's a certain kind of visual language of uh, expressing causality? Uh, yes. Um, causal, causal diagrams, uh, which has been more recently popularized by... Oh, I like popularized and also like a lot of research uh, was done by Judea Pearl. Um, although it started off in the 1930s, ish with Seawall Wright, so on and so forth. I assume you read the book, and oh, it's such a good book. Uh, and actually, I was about to say this. Even a section in the book where he says, oh, this would be really great as a little puzzle, little puzzle game. And I'm like. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, so third book of recommendation, uh, The Book of Why. Why? Uh, the Book of Why by Judea Pearl. It's all about... Uh, how would I summarize it? Yeah, it's about, it's about causality, like, and the math of causality, because it turns out uh, the conventional st statistics language actually can't say anything about causality. Like, you know that little slope line of correlation? Um, or at least, you know, in statistics they say correlation is not causation. Right. Um, and it turns out statistics, conventional statistics, doesn't actually have any vocabulary or any mathematics to talk about causality at all. Interesting. So, really interesting. so that kind of kind of sucks. So Judea Pearl is trying to work on that. And it involves diagrams and drawing and networks. And maybe it could even involve a puzzle game. There's no explorable of it yet. Yes, we may. Yes, we, we may have. This may be the, we may have just planted a little seed here. Or, or That's right. unearthed, unearthed the seed. That yes, was, the uh, fertilizer. Yes. That will be watered, as I think, in the shower. I love it. It's a metaphor. I love it. That, that metaphor worked. Yes. The Thank shower you. water fertilizing that you get it. It's a real setup uh, here. Okay. Uh, well, other question? Other hands? Um, yes. Yeah. Hi. Um, Hi. I feel like you've been like very in and like meta analyzing something. I was just wondering, like, is there a game or a movie recently that like has like so so like it's like a guilty pleasure or something that like you just experience it and you don't even find yourself thinking about it? What do you? Ooh. The question is. Uh, apart Some, from the, our kind of analytic, intellectual, academic conversation, is there some media culture, a game or a film that you just love and you play without, without having to think about it and analyze it? That's and, good and what was your name? Hi, Tom. Tom. Hi, Tom. I did the, um, the, the explorable animation for the jam about uh, time perception. Oh, you did, about time perception. Oh, yeah, that was a cool one. <laughs> yeah, should, you, you all should check out... Uh, Time is an illusion that your brain creates or makes. Is that the title? Yeah, time is a which your brain makes. Yes. So, yes. Nice. <laughs> I also do long games. Yes, long titles. The, the struggle is real. <laughs> yeah. uh, so the question is, do I have a guilty pleasure where yeah. I enjoy it and I don't learn a goddamn thing? Yes. Um, uh, the first example that's coming to mind is, uh, was Bill Wirtz's History of the Entire World. Do you remember that? Have, have you seen that one? The sun is a deadly laser, but nah, oh, there's clouds and stuff. <laughs> it was great. I didn't learn a damn thing, except about the sun. <laughs> um, uh, and like the reason I didn't learn anything is because like, even though it gave like, so many facts in a row, like, it actually is precisely because it gave so many facts in a row, like, it totally overwhelmed my cognitive 
my, con my, my short term working memory. Um, like, it, like, none of the stuff was like connected. Like, it was enjoyable. It was like wonderful. But because of that, I didn't learn uh, anything. But it's still, it still great. So that's okay. my guilty pleasure. But that is so hilarious because you're telling us that your guilty pleasure was something that so overwhelmed yeah, yeah, you okay. with information yeah. <laughs> that you had to let go of it. So it's not at all about like letting go of that stuff. It's that you're taking in so much that you just kind of have to transcend the information and uh, and, and, and enjoy the flow rather than yes. each piece of information. Getting so close to the screen, I can't see anything. All right. Well, on that uh, image, uh, let's thank Nikki Case for an amazing talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you.